As the world battles COVID-19, what can we learn from previous epidemics? The West African Ebola outbreak ran from 2013 to 2016 and was the largest and most complex Ebola outbreak since the virus was discovered in 1976. Once the epidemic was declared over, almost 30,000 people had lost their lives. Professor Melissa Leach was the lead social scientist on the UK and World Health Organization Ebola Scientific Committees. She's now the director of the Institute of Development Studies. Melissa Leach, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, it's great to be here. I'd like to start, if we, if we may, with your experience with Ebola. What are some of the social and cultural factors that impacted the emergency response? Well, I had lived and worked as an anthropologist in the region where the West African Ebola outbreak took hold um, for, for many decades off and on. And when the outbreak started, it became very clear that the response to begin with was um, being received very badly, basically. Outbreak control teams arriving from the outside were um, being turned away by villagers. Sometimes vehicles were stoned, in one case in Guinea. Um, villagers dug ditches across their tracks to their communities to, to keep the teams out. And the whole response, um, with its heavy resourcing, it came late, but when it did come, it came with heavy resources, created a lot of anxiety. And it was essentially because it ran right up against many of the aspects of social and cultural life that are critical to people in the region. So um, the attempt was made to try and stop people from burying their dead and caring for their sick in the ways that they knew were important to um, ensure that their loved ones became good ancestors and to ensure the continuity of social life in the villages. Um, and there was very little attention also to the fact that this is a region of deep inequality where very often um, outsiders over the decades and actually going back as, as far as the slave trade have not had the best interests of local people at heart. And there was a great deal of fear and a lot of rumours and a lot of concern when the response happened um, that this was actually the latest in a long series of, of genocidal attempts to, to, to do in local populations. And, and people were extremely scared. How did you go about overcoming these challenges, particularly, as you mentioned, the need for urgency, particularly if this intervention came late? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> it was really a matter of trying to help turn around the approach that outside agencies were taking from one which was about attempting to deliver messages in a rather distanced way um, towards dialogue and actually working with communities and community leaders of all kinds. I mean, there are many local authorities who are important. It's There are village and town chiefs in this region, but there are also women's leaders, there are um, initiation societies, there are youth groups. And it was a question of, of entering into a respectful dialogue with those people who were actually um, in a position to turn this epidemic around. And this is what was found really quite quickly. I mean, three or four months into the epidemic, and once villagers began to understand and how infection risks happened on what were the forms of social interaction that were making people vulnerable to, to the virus, um, they saw what they needed to do and they very quickly modified their behaviour. Um, they, they turned around practices in families, they made sure that sick people were only being cared for by survivors, um, they made sure that, that quarantines were happening in villages and they adapted burial practices to, to make sure that they were safe. And it's once um, outside agencies began to, to see and understand and, and work with those, those local changes and help to inform villagers in a, in a sensible and respectful way about infection risks that actually they began to work together and you had frontline workers and, and villagers really forming, forming teams and forming a much more positive interaction which in the end was critical in ending the epidemic. It makes so much sense, you know, rather than just kind of having this external thing come in without any understanding of where it's going to, really integrating kind of the community with that external response. What similarities are you seeing with COVID-19? Yeah, well, I think there are similarities, but there are also some, some big differences. So COVID-19 um, is a less visible, easy disease for people to see and appreciate and work with. So in West Africa, once people saw what Ebola did, um, it, people only became 
infectious once they were very clearly symptomatic and dramatically symptomatic in the wet phase of the disease with with um, and it was contact with body fluids that was dangerous for people covid is much more scary and much more difficult for people to understand and deal with locally because people are, are transmitting the virus without any symptoms so i think it's created at local level um bigger challenges for people to understand and adapt their practices to to control it. On the other hand, I think there are enormous similarities and lessons we can learn about the importance of of what um, I tend to call preparedness and response from below. Because as ever, it's going to be um, social practices and relationships at a local level, at an intimate level, which need to change in order to 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 bring this outbreak under control. So whether it's the kind of social distancing that, that we've seen going on in, in, in European and in Asian countries, um, where a lot of it's been focused on um, controlling gatherings and so on, or in the in in the African context that I'm used to, it's about how you can keep things like markets going, um, but operate them in a socially distanced way. Um, it's about trying to to limit social contact while keeping life going. And as ever, um, local people, I think, are best positioned, communities are best positioned to to know what will work, what is feasible, what is possible, what's effective in their own context. And I think this is a big lesson for the whole world, frankly, for the UK where I'm sitting, um, for African countries, that actually what Ebola taught us was the importance of bottom-up community knowledge and action. And I think many countries have not taken those seriously enough in the COVID response, which has very often been government-led, centralised, um, and hasn't really built on that that um, intimate social observation and then adaptation of practices to help control the disease. Mm, and it certainly, you know, isn't a one size fits all if it's going to be exactly. a, a community led response. Exactly. What kind of social impacts have you seen? And I guess that would change very much depending on where one is in the world. Yeah. Well, I think I think context matters hugely. And it's very clear that that um, one size doesn't fit all for COVID and indeed for 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 all epidemics. But um in, with COVID, it's particularly interesting because this was a, a, a disease, of course, that, that has begun and spread from um, wealthy European, North American settings to affect other parts of the world, where the contexts are really very, very different. Um, they're very different economically. They're very different demographically. And I think we're, we're learning now about the enormous vulnerability to COVID that increases with age um, and also very, very different in terms of people's underlying health conditions. So the really big impacts of, of COVID that we're seeing in, in Europe, in North America, um, which are linked often to, to older populations and to factors like obesity, simply don't prevail in some other parts of the world, um, especially in the, in the African context. And there, I think, one has to ask some quite fundamental questions about whether the, the Western-style lockdown model um, is proportionate and appropriate, especially given the, the secondary impacts that lockdown has. And these are impacts on economy. So um, in Uganda, for instance, where we're doing some work, um, we've, we've had military guards in rural settlements preventing people going to their farms, um, closing down churches, preventing people um, carrying out basic economic activities. And that's, that's a sort of death knell for livelihoods and is going to increase poverty. And down the line, we're going to see huge impacts on, on, on life, frankly. And then there are also the secondary health impacts of of lockdown um, where people are either prevented from or are too scared to go to health clinics for um, vaccinations for their children, treatments for malaria, treatments for pneumonia, which um, 
on the African continent kills a million people a year. And yet we've seen the maximum, um, even the, the most dire models of COVID effects on the African continent are predicting 200 to 250,000 deaths. Well, pneumonia dwarfs that. Are we actually getting the treatments for pneumonia? And then there are the blocks in supply chains for antiretroviral treatments and treatments for other non-communicable diseases. So um, I think there's a, a real danger that a disproportionate, over-heavy-handed, one-size-fits-all lockdown response to COVID is actually going to have bigger health and social and economic impacts down the line, um, where, whereas things could have been done in a more proportionate and context-specific manner. It's interesting, um, you know, talking about different countries and kind of the short-term and long-term ramifications yeah. of these interventions that are being put into place. I think initially the narrative was around COVID-19 as a is an equalizer. It's it's a leveler. You know, it's so infectious it could it could hit anyone and now actually we're seeing that it's exposing a lot of inequalities Absolutely. actually. Um what are some examples of that that you've seen? I think there are the I mean just look at the statistics in country after country and um, there's vulnerability to the disease, which is linked to underlying health conditions, which themselves are a result of inequality. So diabetes, obesity, and, and so on. Um, we're also seeing in many European countries, um, including the UK, where I'm sitting right now, um, an excess of COVID cases amongst black and ethnic minority groups. And the reasons for those um, inequalities I think are only really just coming to light and it's a combination of underlying health conditions on the back of deep health inequalities and people's lack of access over many years to the same levels of health care in those countries. Um, it's also to do with things like diet, it's also to do with um, people's ability to protect themselves. So if you're living in very overcrowded conditions, um, you can't social distance in the way that you can if you're if you're a, a, a middle class person with plenty of space. Um, and then there are occupational differences um, in many situations. It's people who are doing essential work either in 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 care homes or in healthcare settings um, or or in in various economic contexts who have not been able to protect protect themselves from this virus because they've needed to continue um, with their essential work and for their own livelihoods, again, creating vulnerabilities. So I think what COVID is, is doing um, is laying bare inequalities and vulnerabilities, which are quite deeply rooted in, in our societies in different ways in different places, but, but nowhere is without them. And actually really challenges us to take inequalities seriously and much more seriously into the future. Yeah, it's really, really, as you say, exposing what was already there and, and in sometimes magnifying it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it seems to me, I don't know if you agree, that the social response seems to be such a big factor in this. You know, for example, in, in places where maybe there's a tradition of wearing masks or kind of ad adhering um, to, to, to social rules, they seem to be faring better in some ways than, than places where that's not the case, say, you know, the United States. Epidemics are, are social phenomena in, in, in a number of different ways. They're social because a virus spreads through social patterns, social relations, people's interactions, the, the ways they move around and relate to each other and come into contact with each other. Um, and, and those things are, are, are determined by history and by, by culture and by people's, people's habits and norms. Um, but they're also social because the adaptations and changes in behaviour which always happen in epidemics and which are necessary to, to, um, to deal with them and to, to tackle public health issues are also social changes. So mask wearing is an example. Um, people, there are, there are different traditions and practices and, and worries and anxieties and forms of acceptance in different parts of the world. Um, in, in Asia, people had a lot of experience from the SARS outbreak and mask wearing has become something really quite normal. Um, but I think we also underestimate the capacity for, for cultural practices to shift. I don't think we want to be romantic and think that, that there are cultures here and cultures there and it will never be possible for, 
for European people to pick up wearing masks as a form of normality. People can adapt and do adapt um, very fast when there's the, the need to do so, when, when they understand um, the reasons why, when there is um, an attempt to bring people on board into a new situation to understand the logics, um, and when the authorities who are helping to, to, to guide and build the dialogue around behaviour changes are, are trusted. So um, yes, we need to appreciate cultural context, but we don't need to kind of reify culture as if it was something terribly static that, that, that cannot change. Um, new norms arise in epidemics. Um, in a way, they're, they're crises that, that disrupt the, the normal and, and open up the possibilities for, for new norms. And I think we're seeing that happen fast around COVID, not always fast enough in all places, but it is happening. I'd like to ask you more about that. What, how do you think COVID-19 will change us both as people um, and also in terms of the way we respond to future um, health emergencies? I think it's I mean I think it's too soon to be to be really definitive about about that this is still a a, a rapidly unfolding and and changing crisis it's going to be with us for for a long time I think that is that is clear and I think there will be there will be different phases of adaptation and and change but um some of the things I think we can we can look to and they're 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 positive as well as negative um is a sense of of appreciation of inequalities. So that's one. And and I think we can look to um, perhaps a future where inequality as it should be is back to the centre stage of how our societies um, think and act and make policy and and think about politics. I think that would be a a positive thing. Um, I think we've also seen some important solidarities emerging. Um, but but this goes both ways. So on the one hand, um, COVID has brought out some some divisions and some nationalisms. I think the unseemly scramble for global resources for PPE equipment and so on, and 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 some countries sort of turning in on themselves and and not helping others has been disappointing. But on the other hand, we've also seen um, a big move towards solidarity at the global level by those countries who have stuck with the WHO. And, and with global forms of, of action. But it's particularly at the local level where I think we've seen all kinds of community-based action, whether it's neighbourhood groups making sure the vulnerable in their communities are fed, delivering food parcels, people looking out for each other, um, neighbourhood networks, um, local groups doing favours. It's kind of brought out a sense of, of community-level altruism, I think, that that offers again positive hopes for the future. And I think the other um, thing that, that COVID does, COVID is a, is a health emergency, but I think it reminds us that um, our societies are very vulnerable to, to risks and uncertainties and to, to sudden shocks of many kinds. And of course, the creeping slow set of shocks that are facing us at the moment are those linked to climate change with, with their many manifestations in floods and droughts and extreme weather events in different parts of the world. And ultimately, climate change will throw up all kinds of, all kinds of shocks. And I think dealing with a health emergency reminds us about the things that are important to prepare and respond to emergencies of all kinds. We're moving into a world which is going to be more disrupted and where resilience, I think, will be a key watchword and making sure that we have the the infrastructures and the forms of knowledge and action to be able to prepare and respond and be flexible in response is going to be important for emergencies of all kinds into the future. Mm, it's interesting. As humans generally, we don't like uncertainty. We don't like unpredictability. We don't like danger. And I think, you know, that can lead to an unhelpful reliance on just doing things one way or trying to find certainty in one model or one way of looking at things. And I think social science invites a messiness that can be uncomfortable because it isn't yeah. certain. Yeah, yeah, it does yeah. involve lots of different factors. So it's, it's nice to kind of invite everyone to the table yeah that's right I think that um I think that that publics I think people at large can often deal with uncertainty much better than 
than they're given credit for. Um, and it's it's more often the, the the politicians who assume that they can't and who want to provide definitive answers and to to give the impression of having everything everything all sorted out and the, and in a way there's an interaction between um kind of the politics of 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 giving the impression that everything's certain and under control um and the realities of uncertainty and and i think we're seeing this playing out country after country over covid frankly and and sometimes acknowledging uncertainty, acknowledging the the different perspectives um, and and tensions that exist over understanding what is happening and what to do about it, um, might might be more helpful and might pave the way for a more a more productive and more respectful dialogue with publics rather than rather than the political response to say we've got it all we've got it all sewn up and this is what to do when actually um publics at large know very well that they haven't um and that's a dynamic that i think often undermines trust in our decision makers speaking of respect and trust and open dialogues it has been an absolute pleasure uh, listening to to all that you have to say thanks so much for your time thank you so much that's great good Remember to hit subscribe for our regular videos. And while you're here, check out our past episodes. 